Good afternoon, everyone. This is David Seibeck at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Welcome to today's seminar. The speaker today is Professor Jim LaBelle from Dartmouth. He's an experimental space physicist. He er he's been at Dartmouth since 1989. He earned his undergraduate degree in physics from Stanford University in 1980. And then he went to Cornell where he received his master's and doctorate degrees in 1982 and 1985 respectively. He then left for the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garking, Germany, where he worked from 1985 to 87, followed by a period at Utah State University in Logan, Utah from 1987 to 1989. He's a member of the American Geophysical Union and the International Union of Radio Scientists. He's had visiting fellowships over the years back to Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany and at the University of Sydney. He's also been a visitor at INPE in San Jose dos Campos, Brazil, and at the European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association in Tromso, Norway as well as the South African National Space Agency in Hermanus. In 2010, he was appointed to the inaugural uh, Lois L. Rogers professor position at Dartmouth College. We're delighted to have him with today. Please place your laptops on mute. Please understand that this is being taped. Please put any questions that you have for him in the chat box, and I will ask them at the end of this presentation. With that, welcome, Professor LaBelle. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, David, for the nice introduction, and thanks, everyone, for attending here. Even though it's Thanksgiving week, I guess it's not much of a Thanksgiving this year, so you might as well listen to a talk about auroral waves. Um, auroral waves, auroral radio emissions, turns out to be a fairly broad talk topic, even if you restrict yourself to electron physics and waves above a few kilohertz. And so I'm going to pay very short shrift to the measurement techniques that lie underlie this subject. And so I've all I've done is I've shown a few of them here. You can see in the lower left here, a picture of a magnetic loop antenna that's commonly deployed ground based to measure these waves. Upper right, you have a example of a sounding rocket bristling with the double probe dipole antennas for measuring uh, waves from Aurora. And the top left shows an upcoming CubeSat mission called Arrow that has all of the above. It's got multiple loop antennas and multiple dipoles and monopoles. Uh, and this mission is dedicated to uh, auroral radio emissions. In fact, it's called Arrow, a rural emission radio observer. Um, and it, the, the instrument here is called a vector sensor. The goal is to measure all three components of E and all three components of V of these waves to be launched in 2022. So before starting, I also wanted to say a few words here about, the, about why we're interested, you know, what, what motivates us to be interested in auroral radio waves uh, or, or radio waves in general. Well, first of all, waves can transport energy and momentum over long distances, um, sometimes in significant amounts. That doesn't tend to be the case for auroral ones, but uh, it, it is the case in some space physics uh, waves. Um, more importantly, uh, often is it through wave particle interactions waves can often limit particle fluxes and determine boundaries between regions in space physics. Um, and also of great importance, more important than transporting energy, perhaps waves transport information over long distances. And so they're the basis for remote sensing techniques for remotely detecting plasma conditions and processes in space. Um, I'd also note that auroral radio emissions uh, often are of the same uh, mechanism that occur in planetary or astrophysical plasmas where you don't have such close access to the physics. And so it serves as a laboratory. And finally, I'll point out that particularly if you are a wave person, okay, auroral radio emissions are intrinsically beautiful and interesting. And, you know, if you find, for example, yourself saying that a spectrogram is, is beautiful, you may be a wave person. Or if you find yourself intrigued by how much information you can glean from a refractive index surface, that's one of the warning signs. You may be a wave person. Um, speaking of that, I, I think that I, it's always good to start a talk like this with a bit of a primer on uh, normal modes in the, in the uh, space physics. 
Um, and there's several ways to depict these normal modes, such as this, uh, refractive index surfaces, CMA diagrams. But the way I've chosen here is called a dispersion surface. Okay, and this particular one is drawn for the condition of the plasma frequency exceeding the gyro frequency. That's typical conditions in the auroral ionosphere. Okay, um, and on this type of diagram, what you do is you put the frequency on the z-axis here. Okay. And on the x-axis, the, the xz plane, you basically depict the normal modes of the plasma uh, that have uh, perpendicular wave vectors. And on the yz plane, okay, this face here, you typically depict, you depict the normal modes of the plasma that have parallel wave vectors, that is parallel to the background field. But the beauty of this uh, technique of the uh, dispersion surface is that you not only see the parallel and the perpendicular limits, but you can see all the modes at intermediate angles here. One of the nice things about this technique also is that, you know, if you, if you take it, by the way, I should point out the normal modes of the plasma then are depicted as points in this space, okay? And you can see that they make surfaces. They aren't just randomly placed in the space, they make surfaces. One of the beauties of this dispersion surfaces depiction is that if you take a normal mode somewhere, okay, um, you know, the, the, the slope of the line from the origin to that mode is related to the, the phase velocity, the phase velocity direction and magnitude of that mode. And then the, uh, the slope of steepest ascent on the surface at that mode, okay, gives you the group velocity or ray velocity. So this, this depiction here has a way of kind of, of, of sleuthing out those information about the wave modes. Now, in your, from your plasma physics textbooks, you probably know that you know, most textbooks kind of restrain themselves or restrict themselves to looking at you know, the perpendicular limit and the parallel limit of these, of these uh, normal modes. And so people are more familiar with sort of these two faces, not with all the angles in between. So for example, in the, in the perpendicular limit here, you have what's called the X mode, which is this mode right here, okay? Which has a cutoff at the X mode cutoff. And parallel to the magnetic field, you have the R mode, which is this mode right here. And the beauty of the dispersion surface is that you can see that there actually are a whole lot, there's a continuum of modes connecting the X and the R mode in between them. In fact, waves can refract from being an X mode to being an R mode. Um, and similarly, this other surface below it is the L mode, uh, pardon me, the uh, O mode and the L mode. Whoops, the L mode is actually this right here. Um, and so anyway, that you, you, know, you can see these, how these modes connect for arbitrary angles. Um, one thing that's, uh, I should also point out, there are a couple of other electromagnetic modes. Uh, well, first of all, I should point out both these, the, the X, R, Rx mode, which is this surface right here, and the LO mode, which is the surface underneath it, you'll notice that as you go to very high frequencies, well above the plasma frequency, the phase velocity and group velocity kind of asymptote to the same value. They both equal C, okay? And so these are the free space waves up here. And these, the, the LO and RX modes are sometimes called escaping modes because they can escape from the plasma. The waves can simply refract on these mode surfaces out of the plasma and become free space modes observable in the atmosphere, for example. Um, so the, the, uh, the, other, the other electromagnetic waves that you see on this graph, one of them is, the, is right here, this surface right here, this is called the Z mode surface right here. And then down here below the cyclotron frequency, this is called the Whistler mode or the W mode. And those, those modes only exist in the plasma. They don't connect to the free space mode, at least not very very readily, okay? Um, turns out there is a connection, but not, not, not so straightforward. So let's see. Um, I wanted to point out that, you know, of great significance to, the, um, to our story are the modes that have, by the way, there's the, the modes that have very low phase velocities. That is phase velocities that are much less than the speed of light. Remember the speed of the light is the, uh, is the phase velocity that asymptotes up at this along here. And so these modes out here, for example, have phase velocities that are quite a bit less than the speed of light. And so these modes are therefore able to, 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 to be at the same speed, the same phase speed as the speed of particles. And so particles can resonate with these waves. So these are called resonances. This particular one is called the upper hybrid resonance perpendicular to the magnetic field. 
And over here, you have your plasma resonance or Langmuir wave resonance, which is parallel. And you see that they're connected in between by resonances at all arbitrary angles in there, which are called the oblique resonances. And you also have resonances down on the Whistler mode, okay? That's another region where you have uh, wave modes that have phase velocities that are quite a bit shallower slope than the speed of light. And so these, the Whistler modes also have resonances. Um, let's see, I thought I'd point out two significant features of these waves that are important for our story of this, of this diagram. The first one is you'll notice there's a special point here where the surfaces intersect, okay, at a point, okay? And this, what, this is very significant for our story because what it makes possible is that waves that start out, say on the Z mode or the upper hybrid resonance or the plasma resonance, these waves can actually refract around. And if they refract to this condition right here, they can refract right through this point here and get on the L mode surface. And so there's like a gateway there, a pathway for these waves to readily convert into the L mode, which then of course can escape from the plasma. So that's a very significant feature of the dispersion relation is that little intersection point there that allows the waves to, to mode convert essentially from uh, the Z mode or upper hybrid resonance or Langmuir resonance onto the L mode. And the other thing I wanted to point out uh, that's kind of significant is the, the Whistler, the resonance mode, the, Whistler mode resonances that I just spoke about. So if you look down here at the very low frequencies and you ask yourself, well, let's go out to where the slope is very, very shallow, where we're talking about very slow phase velocities relative to C. And what you can see here is that if you look at the lay of the land out here, you can see that the, uh, the K vector, the phase velocity is parallel for the low frequency waves near the lower hybrid frequency, which is so low you can't even see it on this graph and is, pardon me, is perpendicular to magnetic field for the lower, lower frequency waves. And as the frequency gets to high, as it reaches the cyclotron frequency, the phase velocity of the mode is parallel to the magnetic field. And then in between, all the resonances take on various angles, you know, in between, as the frequency rises from the lower hybrid up to the cyclotron frequency, the resonance takes on an, uh, an angle that is in between, you know, uh, goes from parallel, from perpendicular to parallel. And the other interesting thing about this re these resonances on the Whistler cone, and you can see it from the lay of the land on this graph, is that if you look at a mode out here on the resonance, the group velocity, which remember is the slope of the surface, the underlying surface, is perpendicular to that phase velocity. You can see that the surface actually goes up in the perpendicular way like that. And so you have a situation where the phase velocity goes from parallel at perpendicular wavelengths, wave, uh, perpendicular to the field uh, K vectors, to, uh, pardon me, perpendicular K vectors um, have at low frequency to parallel K vectors at high frequency, but the ray directions do the opposite. So the ray of the, of the Whistler modes goes from being perpendicular to the magnetic field at high frequencies and parallel to the magnetic field at low frequencies. And this is called the resonance cone. And there's also incidentally a resonance cone associated with the, and a complementary one that's associated with the oblique resonances. So anyway, those are some of the important features. There's a lot to absorb here, but parts of the story coming up. By the way, here's what this surfaces look like for the case of the plasma frequency being less than the cyclotron frequency, which is typical of higher altitudes in the auroral zone and in the auroral cavity for auroral acceleration region, for example. And you know, by and large, you can recognize the same mode surfaces here, like the upper hybrid and so forth, uh, but the connections in between are different, right? Because the topology is different in between. Uh, but notice that you still have a point where the surfaces intersect, uh, but it connects different surfaces. So instead of this upper hybrid and Z mode surface being connected to the L mode, it gets connected through this point to the Whistler mode, which is this mode down here, okay, this point right here. So anyway, those will, those will all be part of the story coming up. Let's move on and talk about now what you observe when you place an antenna out in the environment, in the auroral environment. All of the, what I have here is a collage of spectrograms, and these ones were measured on the ground, okay. So first of all, let me just describe what a spectrogram is. So what you do for a spectrogram representation is you put the frequency of the wave on the vertical axis and you put the time on the horizontal axis. And each 
point here, a dark pixel represents a strong radio signal at a particular time and a particular frequency, and a light pixel represents a weak radio signal at a particular time and a particular frequency. So this is a means of, 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 uh, of displaying, uh, visualizing the variations of the spectrum of radio waves as a function of time. Okay, and I'll be showing a lot of these, so you have to get used to looking at them. Now, on such a spectrogram representation, a horizontal line is a signature of a usually is a signature of a man-made signal. Okay, and so for example, you see it in this uh, lower graph here that was taken at a station in northern Canada. You can see between 550 and 1600 kilohertz, there are zillions of these horizontal lines. This corresponds to the AM broadcast band. Each one of these lines is an AM radio signal um, at a fixed frequency that you're picking up with your receiver, okay? So at South Pole, which is this upper diagram, there aren't, there, the, 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 uh, the broadcast band is rarely visible there because you're thousands of kilometers away from the nearest radio station, but you still have some interference lines that come from the South Pole station itself. But anyway, if you look on the background, if you look, you know, uh, on the uh, superposed on this background of man-made signals, or horizontal lines, you can see a number of signals that clearly look natural in nature. They have a finite bandwidth and their, their, their frequency varies in time. And these are the various auroral radio emissions. And there are four types that are shown that are displayed in these graphs. And there are other types that you can see only from space with a spacecraft, but these four types also can be seen with spacecraft. Uh, let me just review them very quickly. First type here is this one right here, which is called the cyclotron harmonic waves, okay? And notice it's around three megahertz, 3,000 kilohertz. The cyclotron frequency in the auroral ionosphere is about 1.5 megahertz. So this signal right here is about twice the electron cyclotron frequency, okay? Cyclotron harmonic radiation. And then over here to the right of it, you see two different types of kind of bursty broadband uh, radiation. And one of them above the electron cyclotron frequency for the most part is called medium frequency burst. And the other one, which is below the electron cyclotron frequency is called auroral hiss, okay? Um, and so then if you go to the upper right-hand graph here measured at South Pole, you can see auroral hiss again over here on the right-hand side, but you see some other emissions that are in the same frequency range as the auroral hiss, but look entirely different on a spectrogram. And these I'm labeling as AKR, okay, auroral kilometric radiation. Okay, so what I wanted to do was spend a little bit of time talking about each of these, what causes them, what, what's believed to cause them, what their generation mechanism is, some of the unusual features of them. I think we have time to do that. So let's go ahead and, and do that. First, I'm gonna talk about auroral hiss. And auroral hiss is seen, of course, both from spacecraft and from the ground. Spacecraft, on, not uncommonly, observe very interesting uh, frequency time structure with auroral hiss. And this is called saucers, okay? Um, maybe you can see the resemblance of these features to saucers. Um, and so what causes this? Well, it turns out the mechanism for generating the auroral hiss is a resonance between the Whistler waves and the parallel electron beam of the aurora. And the idea is that the, 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 the uh, parallel electron uh, beam when projected onto the direction of the phase velocity of the Whistler waves, you know, if it matches that velocity, then the Whistler waves can be amplified by the beam. And that's, that's, the, that's the method, that's the mechanism that we think operates to produce all this auroral hiss. You know, and it can operate at altitudes anywhere from a thousand kilometers up to tens of thousands of kilometers, and, and, you know, anywhere where the auroral electron beam can exist, okay? Um, the key thing is, and the cause of these saucer signatures has to do with that resonance cone that I talked about a few minutes ago. So the idea is the auroral electrons that are generating these waves are relatively low energy. So therefore, they interact with slow waves that are way out on the resonance cone of the Whistler mode. And, and you'll recall that on the resonance cone of the Whistler mode, the high frequency waves that are near the gyro frequency, they have perpendicular group velocities or ray velocities. The low frequency waves, which are near the lower hybrid frequency, say, have nearly parallel ray velocities. So if you have a source here, and what happens is that the, the high frequency waves have 
very oblique droop velocities. And so their rays come down like this. The low frequency waves, their rays come down like this. And of course, the same on the other side of the source. Okay. And then a rocket or satellite underflying or overflying the source will observe the high frequencies first, then lower frequencies, a minimum frequency when it passes right nearest the source. And then on the outbound, the frequencies rise again. Exactly what you see with these saucers, decreasing frequency, increasing frequency. So most of the saucers observed in space, like with the fast satellite, it turns out come from upgoing electron beams that are associated with the, with the downward current region in the aurora. Um, although you see some in space that are coming that are coming downward. This example in the bottom panel is from a sounding rocket, okay? And this is a downward going saucer. Um, and it's so large, you can see that it, some of the features here last for hundreds of seconds, which corresponds to hundreds of kilometers. Uh, the, the origin of the saucer is quite high up. It's thousands of kilometers altitude that's giving where the source is of these saucer signals. By the way, these type of saucer signals have also been seen these kind of downgoing saucers that are coming from very high altitudes have also been observed by the Demeter satellite. So anyway, that's a very interesting structure. And one of the mysterious things about the saucers, by the way, is how long they last. Because if you look at some of these individual saucer signals here, signatures, um, you have individual ones that are lasting the order of, you know, almost a hundred seconds, you know, a couple of hundred or, you know, 50 or 60 seconds anyway. And, they, you know, each one of these things corresponds to an individual source in of a rural hiss in the rural electron beam and it's a little baffling how you can have a source that's so stationary that lasts for so long and on one location giving a coherent saucer like this if you've ever watched the aurora it's hard to believe that anything stays still there for a minute so that's a bit of a bit of a mystery concerning saucers uh, let me just mention that you know most auroral hiss is not saucers okay and certainly if you look on the ground these are ground-based observations here um, you don't see saucers. What you generally see is more of a kind of a impulsive featureless emission like this. Um, and in fact, that's how a rural hiss got its name. Turns out that, you know, if you play these ground-based uh, uh, emissions, if you, if you stimulate a loudspeaker with these signals, uh, what you hear is a hiss-like noise, a featureless hiss-like noise. So by and large, these are not so structured. Um, but you have many different types, as you can see already on this graph. And so, for example, at the lowest frequencies here that I'm circling right now with my annotation, that's called, this is the VLF hiss, which actually is the subject of most uh, papers on auroral hiss, is the VLF component of the hiss. It's at the very bottom of this graph, because this graph goes up to 600 kilohertz, and VLF hiss is at a few kilohertz to 30 kilohertz. Um, there are several types of VLF hiss. By the way, the VLF hiss is underrepresented here. It's actually much more intense than the LF hiss, which is this other hiss you see right here. Um, but the particular uh, receiving system that I'm showing here rolls the waves off quite strongly at VLF. So you don't see the VLF waves as strongly as they really should be. Uh, but anyway, even amongst the LF hiss, you can see several different types of hiss. Some of them appear rather diffuse in nature. Others appear like a, a bunch of impulses. Um, and so there are various types. Um, I was going to show you there actually are some kinds of structures of the hiss, even from ground-based. Here are some examples. So these are temporal and, and also frequency uh, variations in the hiss. Uh, the top panel shows something called QP emissions, which are at maybe few her few seconds, period. Um, and the, the next panel shows something called a Hissler. Most people haven't heard of Hisslers, but these are structures within the auroral hiss that look kind of like atmospheric whistlers. Um, and they also have periods of about a second or two. Uh, both of these uh, features are kind of similar periods to pulsating aurora. The bottom panel is kind of a shameless promotion for my AGU talk next week or the, in two weeks. Um, this is flickering auroral hiss. And these, these are auroral hiss fluctuations at 150 hertz in this case that correspond to flickering aurora. So HIS does have these kind of temporal and frequency structures, although it's by and large tends to be rather, rather featureless. Okay, let's see, I wanted to say a word about one of the things that, uh, that is, a, is a bit of a problem with auroral HIS, not, you know, and that's how it gets to the ground. Okay, and the reason it's an issue is that if you look at the boundary between the atmosphere and the ionosphere, which somewhat misleadingly is called the Earth ionosphere boundary, okay, 
Uh, the Whistler modes in the ionosphere have an index of refraction that's quite a bit greater than one. They're propagating slow compared to the speed of light. Whereas the index of refraction in the atmosphere, of course, is very close to one. And so what this means, as we all know from our first year physics, is that you know a wave impingent from the ionosphere side, a Whistler wave, can very likely get totally internally reflected. Um, and in fact, if you apply Snell's law, because the index of refraction of the Whistler is fairly high, there's a relatively narrow transmission cone, sometimes only a few degrees wide or something. Uh, and the K vector of the Whistlers has to fall within that transmission cone in order for it to get transmitted into the atmosphere and be observed on the ground. Now, the reason this is a bit mysterious, particularly at very low frequencies, as opposed to the LF hiss at higher frequencies, is that, you know, remember that the waves are generated by a resonance with the part between the particles and the Whistler modes. And remember that the the low frequency Whistler modes near the lower hybrid frequency have approximately parallel group velocities, but have approximately perpendicular phase velocities or K vectors. And so you have the issue that these waves that are, you know, if they're generated in a situation, you know, the VLF waves, unless they're generated at very high heights where their frequency is close to the gyro frequency or something, then they're generated with very oblique K vectors, but they need to have nearly vertical K vectors in order to get to the ground. And, you know, so it's long been speculated that maybe they refract around somehow. Um, Stone Walker and ha Hari Kumar have argued that that kind of refraction can't make for such an extreme change in the wave normal angle. And they've argued for a mechanism that involves scattering off of irregularities in the ionosphere. Now, the aurora is replete with irregularities on various different spatial scales, but in particular, it turns out meter scales are the ones that are, that are needed to scatter the VLF hiss, as it turns out. And the idea is it comes into these irregularities with perpendicular wave vector, gets scattered to a wide range of wave vectors, including some which fit into the transmission cone. So this model explains why, for example, the auroral hiss on the ground is quite a bit lower intensity than that observed with spacecraft. And that's because the ground, only a small fraction of the auroral hiss in space is scattering to the right angles to be able to get to the ground. Um, I will say uh, this, this mechanism uh, looks good. I mean, it explains a number of things about auroral hiss, but it's certainly the actual experimental evidence for it is hard to get, right? It's very hard to measure this pro scattering process happening. You have to measure K vectors with great accuracy in space. And so the experimental evidence for this is still rather meager. Um, although we do know that, you know, there are plenty of meter scale irregulars up there, right? A super darn would be blind without them. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the, this, despite the fact that ground auroral hiss is one of the earliest emissions observed on the ground, the observations date to the 1930s still a bit of an issue, you know, trying to experimentally verify the mechanism by which the hiss gets to the ground. It's kind of an interesting topic. Okay, let's move on and let's talk about the cyclotron harmonic emissions. And they're shown in this collage of spectrograms here. And the critical thing to note is that they're not just at twice the electron cyclotron frequency, right, which is around 3000 kilohertz, but you also have them at three times and four times and even five times the electron cyclotron frequency. And these emissions, uh, all of them except the five times have been observed in space as well as on ground, okay? In fact, so the lower ones were discovered first from spacecraft before they were discovered from ground-based. Um, so let's talk about what causes these cyclotron harmonic emissions. And the interesting thing here is, well, it shouldn't be a surprise, okay? They're cyclotron harmonic emissions, so they're caused by cyclotron resonance. Um, and it turns out that the mechanism that causes these cyclotron harmonic emissions that we observe on the ground or with low orbiting spacecraft is the same mechanism as generates auroral kilometric radiation up in the auroral acceleration region. It's called the electron cyclotron maser mechanism. And the key behind it, this, the starting point, is the horseshoe distribution function of the electrons in the aurora. So the idea is this is a distribution function uh, diagram here. It shows the uh, parallel electron velocity on this axis right here and the perpendicular electron velocity on this axis. And you would think that the auroral electron beam would just be a spot, right? If the auroral electrons are accelerated downward, so you sort of expect to see a spot in the downward direction. But of course, that's not what happens, it turns out, because you know, they're, 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 uh, the electrons are accelerated parallel to the field but the beam has a finite temperature. And so as it moves into the converging magnetic field, 
it spreads out, adiabatically spreads out into this kind of horseshoe. We call it a horseshoe distribution because it actually spreads out to 90 degrees. Some of the particles reflect. Of course, the particles don't reflect directly up the field because those particles are lost. And so you get this horseshoe. We call it horseshoe distribution of electrons. And now into that, we talk about the cyclotron resonance condition, right? This is the idea that the uh, frequency of the wave Doppler shifted by the elect into the electron frame has to match a multiple of the electron cyclotron frequency. And the key thing here that was shown first by Melrose and Wu and Lee a long time ago is that even though the electrons are only 10 keV, you have to include the relativistic factor. You have to use the relativistic gyro frequency. And that has a major impact because it means that this resonance condition turns out to be an ellipse rather than a line in electron velocity space. And then depending on the mode, okay, you plug in your dispersion relation for your favorite mode, depending on your mode, this ellipse can lie in different locations. And in this case, where I've drawn here, if the ellipse lies right, you know, if it cruises along the inside of the horseshoe, okay, remember this resonance ellipse is where the electrons are talking to the waves. And if you have a situation where the electrons have, more electrons have higher speed and fewer electrons have a lower speed, then in that conversation, the electrons are gonna tend to lose energy and the waves are gonna to tend to gain energy and the waves will spontaneously grow. This is the electron cyclotron maser mechanism. And it's very efficient because it can extract energy from a fairly large fraction of the electrons because of the, the shape of the horseshoe. Anyway, uh, coming down from that, the, the, if you apply this mechanism to the lower ionosphere, very different from the situation in AKR, you get the, the, the excited modes are for a very special condition called the double resonance. The, the excited modes turn out to be upper hybrid waves that occur where the upper hybrid frequency matches the cyclotron harmonic. So the result is that you get, you can imagine that you get these special spots in the ionosphere. What's shown on the left-hand side here is the altitude on the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis. And what you have here is your cyclotron frequency and its harmonics. Okay, those are decreasing functions of altitude because the magnetic field gets weaker with altitude. On the other hand, the plasma frequency and the upper hybrid frequency depend also on the electron density. Okay, and so they maximize where the electron density is highest in the F region of the ionosphere around 350 kilometers or something like that. And you'll notice that if the electron density is high enough, you can have these special intersection points where the cyclotron harmonic matches the upper hybrid frequency. And that's the condition for the cyclotron maser mechanism to spontaneously generate uh, waves. They're generated on the upper hybrid branch, but remember that what I mentioned in the second or third slide, there's that point that connects the upper hybrid and, and Langmuir waves to the L mode wave. I think I might have a reminder of it here. And so the idea is that even though the waves are generated over here, the electron cyclotron maser mechanism generates perpendicular waves or perpendicular wave vectors on, on the upper hybrid surface here. These in an, in an inhomogeneous ionosphere, which it's very inhomogeneous there in the aurora, you can refract these waves around. And if some of them refract to this point right here, they can get on the LO surface and then they can have access propagating to the ground and they are observed as left-hand polarized waves. In fact, that's what we observe. The cycloharmonic emissions are left-hand polarized. Let's see, one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, the higher the electron density, the higher the harmonic you can get, right? So if the density gets higher, you can match higher gyro harmonics. And there's evidence for that in this, these data here from South Pole Station. So this shows here the frequency of electron cyclotron harmonic waves this is a scatter plot of electron cyclotron harmonic waves observed at South Pole Station. And their frequency is on one axis and the day of year is on the other axis. And the special thing about South Pole, okay, is of course that a year is a day, okay, in terms of solar zenith angle, a year is a day. And so if we look, uh, first of all, there's no data taken during the nighttime on this experiment, but if you move into the daytime, what you see is you see this stair-step pattern, this interesting stair-step pattern, okay, where you start seeing the different harmonic emissions as the sun rises. So, you know, during the nighttime, you basically only see the 2FCE emission, which is down here. Uh, as the sun starts to rise, you start to get the 3FC emission. The sun rises higher, you get the 4FC. At its highest point, you get the 5FC. And then it reverses on the way down and repeats in subsequent years. Um, 
And so this is exactly what's expected because the as you know, higher so, solar higher sun in the sky means greater ionospheric density because of photoionization. And so you you get your highest densities and hence your highest harmonic emission at under conditions of, of sunlight. Um, by the way, one interesting thing you observe here is that the you tend to get, you rarely get two harmonics at once. I showed some plots of that, but that's unusual. Typically nature excites the highest harmonic that it's allowed to excite and doesn't excite the lower one. So that's kind of interesting. The other thing that's not shown on this graph, I don't show nighttime data here, but at nighttime you primarily see these two FC. There's tons of them, okay? They would fill in this part of the graph here. Um, but you also see very occasionally at nighttime, you see some 4FCD, okay? Um, and these rare occasional 4FCs at night are actually due to a completely different mechanism, okay? What we believe is causing them is not the, is that the two FCE waves that are generated by the mechanism I just described, the cyclotron harmonic mechanism, are combining with each other through wave-wave interactions and they multiply up and create a 4FCE wave. And that the, there's some evidence that's what's happening in the nighttime uh, auroral ionosphere. It's a nonlinear generation of radio waves, so it's kind of interesting. Okay, I wanted to point out that the cyclotron harmonic radiation also has fine structure to it. It turns out many of these auroral radio waves do. And so one type of fine structure is shown in this higher plot, which is what we call flickering auroral roar. So it's sort of 10 hertz or 20 hertz fluctuations in the magnet in the intensity that is we believe associated with flickering aurora, which is a 10 or 20 hertz fluctuation in the auroral light, okay? But the other type that occurs all the time in this auroral cyclotron emissions, if you, if you expand your graph very much, this graph only covers 10 kilohertz here, you can see that it's made up of all these features, typically a bunch of lines, okay? Multiplet features that have kind of sp equal spacing between them and maybe wander together in frequency. And so let me tell you what we think is the cause of this, uh, this fine structure, okay? And the idea is the following. It turns out that in the F region where these, this matching condition is met and where these waves can be spontaneously emitted by the cyclotron maser mechanism, the upper hybrid waves that are perpendicular to the field there are trapped in density enhancements. And then just to say the auroral ionosphere is full of density enhancements, field aligned density enhancements, okay? They arise from various processes, including for example, that the auroral electron beam can be filamented and can produce by impact ionization can produce filaments of density. But anyway, you have all different scales. It turns out that if, if these waves are born in a density enhancement and the scale of the density enhancement is comparable to the wavelength of the upper hybrid waves, then instead of getting a uniform excitation of upper hybrid waves kind of uniformly over a frequency range, you know, you will get standing waves because they're trapped in this, they're reflected by this boundary, trapped in this enhancement, you will get standing waves. It's very much analogous, it's somewhat analogous, I guess, to, to a drum head where you beat a drum head and you get certain patterns on the drum head, you know, normal modes. And so that's somewhat what's happening here with these upper hybrid waves that are being excited. And so you don't get a uniform spectrum. You get certain frequencies picked out by the geometry. And there are two quantum numbers involved actually because you have the radial direction and the azimuthal. Um, by the way, the data shown here from a paper by Peter Yoon, I don't know if I have a, he's the one who's worked out this theory for the case of a, of a circular cylinder, okay? Um, and it turns out that what you expect is you have two different spacings of waves. You have one spacing associated with the azimuthal quantum number and a different spacing associated with the radial. There's like two spacings within each other. And there's actually some evidence for this. Let me show it on the next graph. Um, and this is a rocket experiment that serendipitously happened to pass through the source of one of these one of these auroral cyclotron emissions. This is uh, from the thesis, PhD thesis work of Marilia Samara. And so what you have here, the rocket basically is going through uh, and, it, and the light line here shows the upper hybrid frequency as a function of, of time on the rocket flight. And the, solid, the darker, the heavier white line shows the cyclotron harmonic as a function of time. And you notice that right near the matching points, okay, where the upper hybrid frequency is near the matching point with the cyclotron harmonic, sure enough, you get these strong waves, um, electrostatic upper hybrid waves. And if you blow them up and look in detail, you can see that they're structured. 
And furthermore, you can see that there's two different spacings involved in the structure. There's one kind of coarse spacing. And if you look finer, you can see there's a fine spacing within that coarse spacing. So qualitatively, this fits with Peter Yoon's predictions. Quantitatively, it, the agreement doesn't, it's hard to make work. And that's because the theory has only been worked out for circular uh, dimension cylinders. And that may not be what nature is giving us. Furthermore, we have no idea what nature is giving us because our rocket is only taking one cut through this structure. So we don't really know what its shape is. So, but anyway, it's kind of interesting that we do. And, and the other thing I should point out here is that the rocket, you know, the, unfortunately this experiment on the rocket, it has very nice bandwidth to be able to resolve these features, but the cost is it has relatively low dynamic range. And so we cannot see the electromagnetic waves radiating away from these things. But presumably, these things are the source of L mode waves that are propagating away. If we had sufficient uh, frequency, we would see them. And they propagate away, carrying with them the frequency structure that came from this eigen mode uh, in, in their formation. OK, that's the idea anyway. Uh, by the way, I should point out that this mechanism also seems a little bit familiar to you if you're a magnetospheric physics physicist is because you know this is very similar to the mechanism that's proposed for terrestrial continuum radiation. You recall that Difford Jones a long time ago show, uh, talked about continuum radiation as coming from upper hybrid waves, okay, uh, stimulated near the plasma pause, and then converting, okay, via this same uh, radio window into escaping uh, LO mode radiation. And you know this resemblance is pretty striking. The top panel shows uh, escaping continuum radiation measured in the magnetosphere with cluster. The bottom panel shows uh, cyclotron harmonic radiation measured on the ground, okay? And there's, there's striking similarity and it may be no accident. A lot of commonality here between the, the physics of these two phenomena. Okay, let me say a few words here. Whoa, we're running a little short on time. I'm gonna say a few words about auroral medium frequency burst, but I'll keep it kind of short. The medium frequency burst occurs in, in very short time intervals. Here it is right here. Um, and it occurs in conjunction with substorm onsets, okay? And so the bottom panel shows magnetometer and rheometer data. And you can see that we have two isolated substorms occurring here at Churchill. And for each, at the onset of each substorm, that's when we're seeing these medium frequency burst waves. Remember, these are above the cyclotron frequency, which is typically around 1.5 megahertz. And notice that they last a very short time in contrast to the cyclotron harmonic waves, which often last for hours. Okay, so... Uh, we have some reason to believe that these, these waves are coming from the poleward expanding arc. Uh, when, we, when we look at, uh, when we're poleward of the aurora looking at the arc expanding towards us, we see the MF burst sources going to higher elevations as the arc approaches us. And here you see a meridional chain of stations. And you can see that the, as the substorm expands poleward, you can see that the MF burst occurs at successively higher latitude stations. You can also see that, you know, when the MF burst is extinguished at a station, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not happening anymore. Okay, what unfortunately can the ground based, you're very limited because you have to worry about propagation effects as well as source effects. And, and so, you know, when the aurora comes overhead, often it screens you from seeing those waves, whereas you still see them at the more poleward site. When the aurora comes overhead there, you stop seeing them, but you still see them at the more poleward site. Um, so that's always a challenge of ground-based measurements of these waves. Now on these site, these bursts, what you see, what they look like on this time scale is they look very featureless, right? They just look like a burst, like the auroral hiss. But it turns out that's anything but the case, okay? If you look at them on finer time scales, and here we have finer time scales here, okay? So this is way less than a second. Unfortunately, the, the time graph is not very not very informative here, but this is less than a second. And you can see that MF burst is actually made up of these peculiar fine features. And when you average over a second, you know, what you see is what looks like a broadband thing. But if you look on sub-second time scales, you see it's made up of these features that typically last tens of milliseconds. Sometimes they go upward like this, more often they go downward like these ones up here. Okay. So what is thought to cause these? Well, I can only you know, it's not really, not really firmly known, but it's sort of thought that MF burst originates as Langmuir waves. So instead of upper hybrid waves, Langmuir waves that are generated by the parallel electron beam of the aurora and generated along on the top side, say. And, you know, the idea is, of course, the top side is very irregular. It's not smooth as shown here. 
And so you combine those irregularities in the density with the irregularities in the beam, and you can get all kinds of structure in your Langmuir waves that then when they convert to LO modes through that radio window, they carry the structure with them. Um, let's see, the next graph I think has an idea of that. Uh, basically, the idea is that Langmuir waves in the atmosphere you know, look very different depending on whether you're talking about the frequencies greater than the cyclotron frequency or the frequencies less than the cyclotron frequency. So less than the cyclotron frequency, what you tend to see are what we call bands. And actually, these were also observed by Begon et al. by a satellite. And so you see these bands, and, and you see the bands, and they punctuate at strong Langmuir waves at the plasma frequency. You have a strong Langmuir wave, and it generates a band of Whistler. And these are Whistler waves because they're below the cyclotron frequency and the plasma frequency. And so you get these banded emissions. And I think we may see some evidence of those on the ground as well. But what we think causes the MF burst is the other case, of course, the plasma frequency greater than the cyclotron frequency because the burst is occurring at, at frequencies above the cyclotron frequency. And there you have very structured waves above the plasma frequency. These are sometimes called chirps, okay? And they result from, among other things, Langmuir eigenmodes, okay? Again, very irregular density structure imposing an eigenmode structure on the frequency of the waves and they go off and carry that away and again this this rocket experiment does not show radiating waves away it doesn't have the sensitivity to see those but the idea is that these uh Langmuir waves or oblique uh, uh resonant waves may be the source of the mf burst they may actually be radiating structured waves away in the lo mode to be seen on the ground Okay, I've left 10 minutes here or 11 minutes to talk about the most important auroral emission of them all, which is the auroral kilometric radiation. Maybe I don't have to say as many words about it because it is so well known, okay? Of course, the, it's the strongest, by far most powerful radio emission. Um, it's, and it's observed typically as escaping X mode radiation out in space by distant spacecraft. And it can radiate up to 1% up to of the auroral, the entire energy of the auroral. Uh, you know, at times, at, at certain disturbed times. And, you know, it looks different on the spectrogram depending on whether the satellite passes near the source of the waves or far away from the source where it looks more intermittent like this. Or, you know, if the spacecraft has very high time resolution and frequency resolution like the, sp the cluster spacecraft down here. In that case, you can see that the AKR, like so many of our auroral emissions, is not a homogeneous emission at all, but it's made up of all kinds of fine structures, different kinds of structures. Now, in this case, you see a kind of wandering structure, but you see different kinds. And not all of those have been explained. There, there are explanations for some of those in terms of the microphysics in the, in the source region, uh, but they haven't all been explained. The source of AKR is in the auroral acceleration region where the electrons are accelerated. There's a cavity there, the auroral cavity. And the density there is much, much less, much, very small. So the, the plasma frequency is way less than the gyro frequency. And that turns out to be the necessary condition to get very strong X mode generation from the cyclotron maser mechanism, the same mechanism I talked about a few slides ago, but just at much higher altitudes and in a very low density environment. So what you primarily get is very strong X mode radiation going outward. There's some O mode and other modes also that get made by and by, but the primary is X mode. The primary excitation is the X mode. Okay, so these satellites have made a lot of, lot of progress recently. Let me just highlight a few of the things that have been observed in the last decade, a few de couple of decades with, the, with these various uh, rural satellites that have made some dramatic advances in AKR. So the FAST satellite, for example, directly measured the horseshoe distributions of the electrons in the source region. So that's, that really confirmed this idea that it's the horseshoe and the, what they call the shell maser mechanism, which had been predicted earlier by theorists like Wingley and Pritchett and so forth, but then was shown experimentally by the FAST satellite. Um, the geotail satellite, um, Morioka and others have, have used the, the distant geotail satellite measurements of AKR is a remote sensing tool because it turns out that this auroral cavity that characterizes the, the acceleration region, that's, that's, where the, that's where the AKR comes from and it's generated the local cyclotron frequency. So the frequency of emission of the AKR, okay, can be mapped to an altitude of emission because we know the variation of the gyro frequency with altitude along the auroral field lines. 
And so what you get here is a very interesting method of remotely sensing the extent, the altitude extent of this auroral cavity that where these emissions are, are coming from. And there's been sort of a cottage industry by the geotel uh, satellite community of looking at some very interesting aspects of substorm developments and so forth by using this remote sensing tool. Let me just, one last one, the cluster satellite. Cluster has made many seminal contributions to AKR. But one of them shown here is, you know, finally answering the question of how the AKR is beamed, okay, which was an age old question, you know, filled cone, hollow cone, whatever. Um, but what the cluster satellite, by using the, the four cluster satellites as elements of an interferometer, okay, uh, they were able to show that the, that the AKR is actually beamed out and what's called it's beamed out within like 15 or 20 degrees of the plane that is tangent to the magnetic field at the source. Okay, kind of interesting, a tangent plane. And out it goes into space and there's very successful modeling with this, with this beam pattern. Um, so anyway, those are some of the recent advances. I wanted to touch on something that's close to my heart, okay, which is a controversy regarding AKR. And I alluded to it earlier, but this shown on this graph right here are ground-based measurements, okay, South Pole Station of what appears for all the world to be AKR, right? It's in the AKR frequency range. And if you blow it up and look at the fine structure, it even has these kind of threads. These are very reminiscent of those threads that we saw in the cluster satellite data that I showed a moment ago. And so this is strong kind of circumstantial evidence that somehow the AKR doesn't just beam out into space as escaping X mode radiation, but, but, but somehow it's also coming back towards the planet. And this is an idea that actually has been championed for a long time by Hiroshi Oya in Japan, who uh, has various measurements that he claims show this from the various uh, low Earth orbit satellites. Let me just describe to you a mechanism by which it's possible that you could get AKR coming backwards at, down to the Earth. Okay, and here it is. And again, uh, the basis of it is a, is, some, is a paper of cluster data, cluster satellite data, okay? You may be excused for not being familiar with this paper because it's in a somewhat obscure source, but um, let me tell you about it. So this is the only data on this graph right now is this little inset right here, which shows a spectrogram of cluster satellite data as the satellite passes close to the source of the auroral kilometric radiation. And the interesting thing that you notice here that would be easy to miss is this um, small gap. You see that little gap in the, in, the, in the spectrum right there, that tiny gap? Um, it would be easy to miss that. But you know, there's a good lesson why scientists should never, you know, if, if there's anything there that's not you know, noise or whatever, you should, you should pay attention to it. It turns out that this gap is related to the gap in the, in the mode structure of the, of the X mode, you know, perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if we go down here and look at the mode structure, let me get the, let me get the appropriate annotation tool back here. Um, so if you go and look at the mode structure, you have your X mode. This is your X mode right here. And that of course is the primary escaping AKR because it connects to the free space modes out here. But you also have a, a, the Z mode here, which is also a, a branch of the X mode. Okay, and it goes up to the upper hybrid frequency, whereas the X mode cuts off at the R cutoff. And it turns out there's a little gap there. There's a little gap in there in which there's no waves. Well, there are L mode waves cutting through there, but the L mode's the wrong polarization. It can't talk as nicely to the electrons, so it doesn't get excited. The waves that get excited by the megazer mechanism are these X mode waves here and these Z mode waves down here, and there's a gap between them. And this paper here by Motel makes a very convincing argument that this little gap in the data up here is exactly this gap in the mode structure. And the cluster is seeing X, escaping X mode on one side of that ga gap and Z mode excitation on the other side of that gap. Okay. Um, and the idea is that, you know, for, you need, you, for the cyclone region mechanism, you need very low densities in any case. But if the densities are very low, but not that low, you get Z mode excitation from the mode mechanism. If they're very, very low, you get X mode excitation. You can get either. And what's really interesting, what I should point out is, of course, um, so the Z modes that are excited here, I mean, that what the cluster is showing here is there's a whole like hidden AKR up there of Z modes that um, is up there. 
these Z modes, let me remind you, in this regime where the cyclotron frequency is bigger than the plasma frequency, these Z modes can refract around and can reach this point right here and move and refract onto the Whistler mode surface. And so we think that's what's going on. You start with, you excite the Z modes in the rural kilometric radiation source region uh, by the maser mechanism. There's strong gradients up there that can refract the waves. If the Z mode waves refract to this point right here, they can refract right onto the Whistler mode branch. Of course, Whistler modes can propagate long distances. We know they can get down to the ground, right? If they have the right K vector at the base of the ionosphere, they can get right down to the ground and be observed on the ground. So this is the idea. This idea is an adaptation of the idea that was originally proposed by Oya. Let me just point out that this is very difficult to prove this mechanism. Even if you got a satellite up in the region where this mode conversion was taking place, it would be very hard to tell that it was going on. So how do you go about trying to prove this mechanism? Well, there's an interesting idea that comes out of this paper. And this paper shows that not only do you get Z mode radiation from some locations and X mode from others, depending on the density, but at the same location, you can get excitation of Z modes and X modes at the same place, but in different frequency bands, okay? So higher frequencies X mode, lower frequency Z mode. This is the calculated growth rate of the cyclotron maser from a horseshoe distribution in the source region. And it can excite either X modes or Z modes. And so the exciting thing about this is that you could imagine that you, that you could have these very fine structures that are observed with the escaping X mode. So if you, if, you, if you had the electron distribution function doing something to make some particular peculiar fine structure, like a loop or something like that, you know, what this says is the same fine structure would be excited in the Z modes that go eventually to the ground as would be excited in the X modes that go escaping out into space. So one way to look to try to prove this mechanism is to try to look for correlations of fine structures between escaping AKR in space and AKR that's leaked down to the ground. And so I've undertaken a collaboration with some of our colleagues in cluster, uh, namely Keith Yearby and Jolene Pickett. And I have been operating the cluster satellite for a couple of years now, as often as we can in conjunction with South Pole. And we've got a number of interesting events. I show the, the best typical example, the, actually the best example we have so far, which is close to the smoking gun. So what you see the bottom panel is South Pole, ground-based, okay? The top panel is various cluster satellites, 11 Earth radii, way the heck out there, looking at escaping X mode. Here you have a situation case where you have a rising fine structure feature in the cluster at the exact same time and same frequency, a rising feature on the ground-based. So it's not, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to see even more of these or finer ones, which we don't see, but it is pretty close to what I call the smoking gun or this, this uh, mechanism that says that you can observe our AKR actually even at ground level. You don't have to be on a spacecraft way out far away from the earth. Okay, I see that I'm just over time, it's one o'clock. So let me just finish with my last slide, um, which is just a summary of these various emissions. And this isn't all the emissions there are. I've only picked some, there are others. Um, but I just wanted to say as the last minute is that for young people out there, it's a golden age of radio observing right now. And that's because you have these software defined radios, you know, the size of your pinky that have, you know, allow you to do all the digital signal processing. You can, you can, you know, it, analog to digital convert and digitally signal process your waves on a tiny device the size of a pinky that costs $20 or something. You have disk drives, you know, 12 kil terabytes or something. So you just have the technology now to, to explore these waves in ways that we couldn't have dreamed of 10 years ago. And so I really think that there's, we're poised to make a lot more advances and a lot more interesting observations in this field because of the, the technology that's come up. Okay, sorry to run over by a, by a minute here. Um, I'll end there though, um, and take any questions. Thank you. What a wonderful seminar. Thank you so much, Professor LaBelle. Uh, I think you've created a new generation of wave people as you began. Uh, so interesting, so diverse, so many interesting topics. There are a couple of questions and one of them interestingly came right at the beginning of your talk, but it's directly related to what you were just showing right at the end of your talk. Uh, Boris Petrovich asks, do you know of or some person or some software that anyone is using machine learning algorithms 
that could be applied to data from example, FAST or Demeter together with ground stations to conduct multi-year statistical analyses of AKR reaching. Well, that, that is a, yeah, very interesting question. I don't know of any. It could be that some of my, our colleagues on cluster are doing something like that, but mm -hmm. I don't know of any. I do know a lot of people have, have cut their teeth or broken their back or whatever on the problem of trying to, you know, uh, make automated detectors of whistlers and other features. Uh -huh. It's quite a challenge, particularly with the old days, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I, you know, that's a very interesting idea. And this data would be ripe for that because it's it's too much data for a person to look at, you know, particularly okay. all these fine structures and all these emissions, not just AKR, but also the roar and the burst. Okay, if, if Boris sends me an email, I'll put him in touch with you because uh, that got his attention right away. Well, I'm, I'd like to interject one of my own quick questions. How often is AKR seen on the ground? Is this oh, extraordinarily well, rare? It, it is there a lot. It has a, it has a strong uh, nighttime daytime dependence, which must have to do with propagation. And so you never see them in austral uh, summer. And you start seeing them in late May at South Pole and you stop seeing them at the end of August. Okay. Uh, but in between there, you see them almost daily. I see. Um, you know, it's not uncommon at all. Okay, excellent. Uh, for those who are thinking of writing a question in, now's the time to do it because I see only one more. Xing Feng asks, the cyclotron maser mechanism produces EM waves primarily at oblique or perpendicular mm -hmm. directions. How does the cyclotron harmonic radiation, how does the cyclotron harmonic radiation get to be detected by the South Pole Station on open field lines on the ground? Now, that's a very good question. And, and what we believe happens is that the waves refract. So you have strong density gradients up there. And th so the waves indeed are oblique when they are generated, but then they propagate and they, they bend on the density uh, density irregularities and become parallel so that they can penetrate to the ground. Now, the uh, first of all, they, they also, actually, pardon me, I should say they become parallel so that they can convert to L mode and come to the ground. Remember that the little uh, Ellis window point, the connection between the Langner upper hybrid surface and the L mode surface is in the parallel direction. And so the waves have to, they have to, they have to uh, refract to parallel, then they can go through that window, then they become LO waves and they can easily get to the ground. And the, the, this has been shown uh, in a paper by Peter Yoon, um, where he actually uh, put a model density distribution in this density profiles in and actually showed oblique waves refracting to this window condition, uh, you know, in, in modeling. Um, you know, we haven't had haven't been able to make measurements with anywhere near that kind of you know, accuracy or precision out in space, but at least it's supported by modeling that it can happen. Okay, very good. Uh, with a, with a, I think with a smiley face, Pat Reif notes that those people who say they can hear Aurora on the ground might be right if they're <laughs> listening in AKR. That's right. If they have like little radios in their ear or maybe their two picks up radio waves or something. Um, right. You can definitely uh, play these sounds. There are various methods of converting radio waves to sound and you can apply them in the, to these Aurora waves and get sound. And in fact, if you ever watch Bob Ether's IMAX film called Solar Max, which was put out a, a couple of decades ago now, it's worth a watch. Um, whenever the aurora comes on the screen, you hear these weird sounds. Those are the sounds of our aurora uh, cyclotron harmonic waves. Um, and so you can hear them on that, on, that, uh, on that movie if you like. Of course, they're converted to sound waves by electronic sure. means. Of course. Sonification. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, not, not directly heard. That's right. Let's see. We've got a couple more questions, at least. Conrad asks, uh, again, he's clearly, uh, people are very interested in the last topic that you discussed, uh -huh, whether, uh -huh. whether anyone has tried matching MMS observations with ground observations of AKR. That's very interesting. Not that I know of. Maybe we should be looking into that. We've uh, done a lot of work with GeoTail. The constraint of GeoTail, the beauty of GeoTail is it's up there all the time, you know, 24 hours mm -hmm. a day, data, you know, so forth and so on until recently. But it, for, for 30 years, you know, decades, we had GeoTail data. Problem with GeoTail data is it does not have the resolution. It only has eight second resolution. So you can't pick up those fine structures. And so we've seen a number of correlations with GeoTail, but what I really wanted to go after was the fine structures. And so Cluster was the instrument of choice because it has this, um, and MMS could be also. I, I, yeah, I just 
first made contact with the cluster team and Keith Yearby and Jolene Pickett. And so we've been following that up, but maybe we should include another spacecraft uh, to get So more uh, it actually is true. There's a gold mine of observations out there as you concluded your talk, both spacecraft and ground-based. Okay, next question is from Tron Fei Dong. He's wondering if electron ion or electron neutral collisions below the exobase in the ionosphere have any effect on the radio emission? Uh, they very definitely do. Um, and in fact, that's something that the cyclotron maser mechanism at low altitudes has to overcome in order to get uh, maser generation of these upper hybrid waves. So you have to include those terms in there in order to accurately uh, calculate those growth rates. Uh, Peter Yoon has done that in his paper. Um, and of course, the, the collision frequencies are very important at lower altitudes in the D region. Um, so that's what leads to significant absorption of signals of, of these frequencies. And that's a real challenge for ground-based observers. So it turns out if you're underneath the aurora, that turns out to be the wrong place to be to measure auroral radio emissions uh -huh. on the ground, okay? And in fact, equatorward of the aurora is no good either because there's diffuse aurora there that generates this D layer that absorbs the waves due to the collisions. So where you really want to be is poleward of the aurora. That's why our stations are at places like Tulik Lake, Alaska, or Sandrastrom, Greenland. You want to be poleward where you look kind of through the polar cap, which you can at least hope is somewhat laminar and low density, not always, but some of the time. So you get this nice clear shot at the aurora sources, the sources above the aurora. But yeah, the, the collision frequencies play a big role, particularly in the ground, in what you, uh, determining what you can observe on the ground. Excellent. Last question, though. Last question, as far as I can see, is from Xenon Meets Cars. And uh, Xenon is curious to know whether, in theory, it should be possible to see a good ground spacecraft correlation in ULF, ELF observations in the frequency range from 0.1 to 5 hertz? Uh, well, that's, that's a little bit aside from my expertise, but I believe it is possible, and I believe people have done that. Um, I think if you look at some of the papers by Mark Engebretson mm -hmm. and uh, maybe Mark Lassard, I think people have, have published measurements of coincident, like with the GOES satellites and ground-based st stations like South Pole, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in that frequency range. I guess maybe it's lower frequency range. They're more ULF. I, what was the frequency range that Xenon was interested uh, in? 0.1 to 5 hertz. Okay. Point, what, th these observations I'm talking about are like 0.1 to 1 hertz. Mm -hmm. um, as you go above 5, I think they're, they're, they're well, actually check that. Point, you said 0.1 to 5 hertz. That's so correct. These, these emissions I'm talking about are, are, at, um, are in that range, I think. Okay for the most part. I mean, as you go to the lower part of that range, well, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's fair to say that people, that th those, some studies of that type have been made in that frequency range. It, it's a little bit off, as you see, I'm, a, a, I'm kind of electron, electron physics person, so I'm not as yeah. familiar with that literature. Yeah, okay, super. I would like to thank you on behalf of everyone, and in particular, all of the people whose questions you've answered have sent special thanks to you, so particular thanks for them. This was a delightful seminar, a real treat for Thanksgiving. I'd like to uh, remind everyone that next week is the last seminar in our series. It'll be by Ian Mann, and it'll be about ground-based observations by magnetometers. So perhaps in the range of 0.1 to 5 hertz, amongst other things.